you for joining us on this uh, lovely uh, June morning for our Speedy Speakers webinar. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by Charlotte from Lloyds Banking Group and Sylvia from Knights PLC. Um, they'll be doing an input very shortly. Um, just before we start, just so you know, we have a Q&A box and a chat box at the bottom. So your videos will all be turned off and you won't be able to talk. But if you have a question, please do use those boxes to ask them and we'll be working through them as our speakers um, talk. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Charlotte from Lloyds Banking Group. As a project manager, I am helping our customers with something that's gone wrong and that we really want to help them to fix it. So what I'm in charge of specifically doing, um, I am making sure that I am telling all of our senior team here at Lloyds Banking Group about the progress that we're making to put things right for our customers. Um, I also speak to customers on the phone almost every day and I write emails to them, um, listening to their concerns, reading their emails and, and also explaining to them the progress that we're making to, to help them. So how did I get into this job? Well, um, when I finished school, I wasn't entirely sure what I wanted to do. Um, and I knew that my favourite school, uh, my favourite subject at school was French. So I decided to apply for university and I got in and I studied French at the University of Southampton. So um, I then didn't know what I wanted to do when I finished my French degree. Um, and I kind of was a bit worried about seeing this chasm of not really knowing what I was going to do with the rest of my life. Um, so I just googled a few things um, and I looked online for graduate jobs. So I applied for a few graduate jobs um, and after going through an assessment process for Lloyds Franking Group I found out that I was successful at getting a job here. So on the graduate scheme, um, it's a really amazing thing to do actually. I, I moved around um, and tried lots of different jobs for, for eight months. Um, and that was a really incredible learning experience for me because I was able to meet lots of new people, learn lots of new things in quite a short period of time. And this is something that you can do even if you don't go to university. So there are apprenticeship schemes across most of the major national and global employers. Um, and Lloyds Banking Group is one of them that has a really fantastic apprenticeship scheme where you can not really know what you want to do, apply for apprenticeship scheme and try some different things out, learn some new skills, um, which is a really interesting thing to do if you're not sure what you want to do. So when I finished on the graduate scheme, I went to work in our politics team here at Lloyds Banking Group, which engages with government and talks to MPs about how um, their local constituency is, is doing um, and how the group is helping to Britain to prosper. So we, we listen to their concerns about their constituencies and talk to them about how we're helping them. So perhaps I can tell you a little bit about other jobs that you can do at Lloyd's. Um, so Lloyd's Banking Group is a very big organisation. Um, as perhaps you know, there are about 60,000 employees um, working for the group. So what that means is that there are so many different types of jobs, which is really, really cool, actually. You could speak to people on the phone all day um, and um, kind of be engaging with people, or you can be part of our cool tech team that designs our banking app. You could be part of our HR team, helping line managers to support their teams. So there's loads and loads of different types of things. Anything that you could think that an organisation would be doing it, it's almost certain that Lloyd's is, is doing it. So, um, yeah, you can, I mean, you can also be part of a team that, that designs new and fresh financial products as well. So not only are we a business, but we're a bank. So we, we help people with their banking services, like a new mortgage or a new type of credit card. So any tips that I have for you guys? Um, I think the biggest piece of advice that I would probably give to you at your stage of life is start to think about what you enjoy doing and then think of that as a skill. Um, so when you leave school, the focus of the work environment is, is less about your kind of specific school subjects like um, maths or physics or English. And it's actually more about the broader skills that you possess. So try to use those to your advantage. And I'll explain what I mean by that now. So, for example, in, in school, I really, really liked English and I really liked French. And what that means is I really like um, talking to people. I liked 
talking to my friends. I liked making new friends. So I have used that to my advantage and I have been successful in my workplace because I know that I can build really strong relationships with people quickly and I can communicate really quickly in a simple and clear way. And I'm good at written communication. So I can write with empathy and I can write in a way that means that people can understand me well. So maybe you're good at maths and physics, but think about not just what that means for the subject, but what that means you're good at more generally. And, and, and try to think about how you could use that skill to your advantage in your workplace. So maybe you're really good at maths and physics. So thinking about whether you could be a mechanical technician or an engineer or an architect. Think about those skills in a more broader sense. And I suppose um, my next piece of advice would be don't ever let anyone ever tell you that you're not good enough to do something. Um, I, my friends told me when I first started thinking about graduate schemes that I, I couldn't or I shouldn't become a banker, I shouldn't work for a bank because it's a male dominated environment and it's something that being a kind of bubbly outgoing person, I wouldn't be good at it. Um, I have done it and I love it. Um, and I'm glad that I didn't listen to any of those people telling me that I wouldn't be good enough. So that's my next piece of advice. So I think that's probably my five minutes up and I'll um, hand over to Sylvia, if that's okay, everyone, unless there's any questions immediately. Thank you so much, Charlotte. It's really good advice there for everyone listening in. Um, we have had a question for you, if you're happy to take it now, sure, Charlotte. Yeah. Um, so I know you gave some really good advice about kind of thinking about all the different skills that you, that you gain through your kind of education and, and how they might apply to a job. But someone's asked, what skills do you need for your particular job? Okay. So I think um, there are quite a few different skills that I've learnt over the years that have helped me, that, I'm, that, mean, I'm, I'm, um, that mean I'm good at my job and that I need for my job. Um, I would say um, the most important thing is, is what I've mentioned, which is the ability to build relationships with people quickly. Um, my job um, means working on this project. This project is, is quite a difficult, it's quite a difficult thing. It's something that's gone wrong. Um, it's something that the group um, wants to fix really quickly. And so in order to make sure that we do this in the best possible way, that helps customers in, in the best possible way, I need to be able to build relationships with people, to build relationships with our customers, to build relationships with people in the rest of the organisation that can help me answer questions if I don't know the answer. It's about a subject that I don't know loads about myself. So, and, and won't ever know everything that there is to know about an organisation. So being able to make friends and build relationships with people and communicate effectively has been probably the single biggest thing that's helped me. I think um, the other thing is an attention to detail. This is um, not only a secret project, but also a very, very um, high pressure and high profile project internally. It's got lots and lots of senior people um, really, really dedicated to making sure that it goes right. Um, and, and very senior people putting some amount of pressure on us to make sure that we are uh, doing it right. Um, and those senior people, um, it's important for us to get it right for them. So um, attention to detail, making sure that everything that we do, that I communicate to them is, is right, not just um, something that I'm guessing at, making sure that I'm certain that the information I'm providing them is, is correct and allows them to make decisions and do their job effectively. So I think probably those would be the two things that I need for my job right now. Wonderful, thank you Charlotte. Um, we've had a couple more questions but I think these will actually be relevant for both of our speakers. So what I'm going to suggest is if we hand over to Sylvia now and then we'll pick up some of these questions that have come through in the Q&A box at the end, is that okay? So Sylvia, um, if you'd like to give your talk now, that would be wonderful. Hi there, thank you Charlotte. Um, yep, yeah, so as Charlotte said, my name's Sylvia um, and I'm a trainee solicitor at Knights PLC, which is a law firm with around 12 offices in the UK um, and I'm currently based in their Leicester branch. Um, the Speedy Speakers team asked me if I'd like to take part in today's session and I jumped at the chance because 
if I'm honest, it wasn't really that long ago that I was sat in the same position as you guys are. And I remember how daunting it was to have that many career options available. So for the next five minutes, I get to try and convince you, if you hadn't thought it before, that a career in law might be worth exploring as one of those options. So while I was preparing to speak to you, I sat down and I thought about the kinds of questions that I had when I was trying to decide on the next steps to take after school. So I'm going to chat you through a little bit about how you can become a lawyer, just generally, um, and then also address the question that is probably on everyone's mind and see if I can answer whether it really is as glamorous as it looks on TV. So a trainee solicitor, like I am, is just someone who's between two years and up to the night before qualifying. And every solicitor has to do a period of training for two years where you work in a firm or with a company and you basically just learn on the job. Um, and that, take, that takes two years, as I said. And in terms of what we do at night, we're what's called a commercial law firm. So essentially that means that we do anything but criminal law. So instead of clients that are dealing with criminal proceedings in the criminal court, we can have individuals or companies who they might come to us with legal problems such as it might be a supermarket chain that's come and wants our advice on recovering a debt from a supplier. It could be sort of you know, lay people like you and I, it could be you know, all the admin to do with buying your house, selling your house. Um, another example is if you wanted to invest in or buy a company, you would come to us and we would help you sort of analyze the company's accounts, have a look at it, see whether it's really a worthwhile investment, good or bad idea, and we'd advise you in that respect. So I work in the employment team at the moment, and that's where I hope to qualify um, in October. But what's so good about the legal sector is that because there are so many routes into it and so many different areas that you can work in, every, there's, there's sort of an area that suits everybody. Um, and also, you know, different routes will suit different people's circumstances and what suits you better, whether you want to work alongside. You know, it's really varied and that's what really drew me. Um, because my route into becoming a sister wouldn't really be considered the traditional one. Um, the one that most people sort of talk about and hear um, on television is that you study an undergraduate law degree and then you start a job in a law firm straight off. But actually what I did was study German and Spanish, so languages like Charlotte. Um, and exactly like Charlotte, finished university and thought, I'm not really sure what I want to do at all. Um, so I did a little bit more studying that wasn't law related and then kind of came back to, to the sort of legal um, career path, so to speak. Um, but before I go any further, I should probably explain that for those people who do decide that they want a career practicing law, you've basically got two options for the directions that you want to go. You can either become a solicitor, which is what I want to be, or a barrister. And if I put it really simply, a barrister is, they're the ones you see on TV, standing up with the wigs, being very clever and very important. And the solicitors are usually on court days sat behind them, but actually doing a heck of a lot of work as well. Um, and a solicitor's job is more sort of team-based. So we'll do a lot of the sort of background work and then, if our case is one that requires a court day, then we'll pay a barrister to then speak up and advocate, which is just, it's another way of saying communicate with a purpose. Um, so the solicitors are the ones in, in the background kind of, but that's fine by us because we're quite happy being there. We don't really want to be the ones up addressing the judge because I, I think that's quite stressful. Um, but, if, but if you don't fancy either of those and you're still interested in working in the legal sector, there are lots of other roles you could have. And just off the top of my head, you could, you can have a job in the coroner's office. So a coroner, if there's a death, if somebody dies in custody or there's a road traffic accident, but it's no one's fault and there's a chance that things could be addressed for the future, the coroner will do what's called a coroner's inquest and they might have sort of recommendations that come out of that. And they will typically be ex-doctors or ex-lawyers. And another role that you could have is if you wanted to be a court usher, which is essentially just court staff, but that one's really good because you get to hear all the best gossip. Obviously, you can't tell anybody, but it's really good to know. Um, I'm just looking at the questions that we were asked to prepare for. How did you get into your role? So I've kind of explained the way that I got into it, but in terms of the other options, you can, you can always work at the firm while you study. That's a really good way of gaining relevant legal experience. A bit like the graduate scheme that Charlotte said she took part in. It's great because you're learning on the job. Another option that's been quite recently brought in is what's called a trainee apprentice. So you become a trainee apprentice right after your A-levels and then that lasts for seven years and you essentially build up a portfolio. So you will 
do lots of tasks and log those and you build up your experience across seven years and at the end of those seven years you can qualify as a lawyer and for some people that works a bit better um it's certainly financially it's a lot better because you can work at the same time as studying and that studying is not cheap but you guys have not been told that um in terms of my day-to-day -day, as a trainee you support the work of the lawyers in the firm with what they're doing and because i'm lucky that i work in a big employment team it means that any given week i can be asked to do a really wide variety of things and that's what really drew me to law as a profession was as i said sort of different sectors but even if you only work in one niche area no two days are ever the same and i can never say that it's boring um, and i thought instead of going into sort of what i've done this week or anything like that i thought if there's any question and answer time then i can address if anyone wants to ask sort of you know what have you been doing this week I've got a few examples, which um, are obviously some of them are coronavirus related. Um, so yeah, day to day, I might do some research and research can involve, that's a, a lot of what trainees do at my level is research. And it just involves looking at legislation, looking at case law and um, previous cases that have been published and written about to try and find an example of something that you either want to argue for or against and use as backup. Um, but that can also be if a client asks you a query then you can say, well, for example, this happened here, here and here. And then that's, you know, you present that and email them or write them a letter back with your advice. Um, in terms of the reality, I have to say it is not all expensive lunches and VIP clients and, you know, international late night corporate deals, just like you see on TV. Um, and when I worked as a paralegal, which is basically like a lawyer's assistant, that I did quite a lot of the dreaded photocopying. But I also got to help draft really really passive aggressive letters and listen in on the juiciest client gossip and meetings so i actually think it balanced out perfectly fine um but as i say the work we do is is really varied and you know that's just in one firm and there are 101 different areas of law and you know again that's that's just if you decide to become a solicitor or a barrister um that you can practice in different areas any tips for students to consider when thinking about careers i would say if i could have gone back and done things slightly differently is a good place to start is that is to sit down and think about what interests you and what you're good at so i think a mistake that some people make is they sort of jump start and they'll go looking for a career that sounds like they'll like it or sounds really exciting but actually i think if you take a breath sort of sit down it's sensible to write out a few things you're good at maybe ask your friends and family if you want a little ego boost at the same time and um, because sometimes they'll mention things you wouldn't have thought of and um, but then the second part to that is once you've got that list, just keep that in mind when you're thinking about or researching different careers. And it means that, you know, you'll be approaching it with sort of a wider view um, and you, you might not end up wasting some time, you know, if you're going down a route that you're maybe not as enthusiastic about what you thought you might be at the start. Um, but yeah, that's that's all I've got to say. So obviously, if anyone's got any questions, I'll hand over back to Charlotte, I think. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. That was really insightful and really useful, I think, for a lot of students who might be interested in working in the world of law. Um, we have one specific question for you, which is, um, what are the best DCCs and A-levels to take for a career in law? That is a really good question. So my answer would be that there really aren't any that, are, that aren't going to help you. I think there are some universities, if you're applying for an undergraduate law degree, who, who won't accept um, A-levels in general studies and critical, critical studies, critical thinking. Um, but your careers advisor can give you some advice on that. Those are the two that I know of that some law firms can, or sorry, some law schools can turn their noses up. But other than that, because for example, I've done languages and I know lots and lots of lawyers that I've met who didn't do an undergraduate law degree and didn't necessarily do a law A level, so that definitely won't that won't negatively prejudice you know any applications you do. I think if you can show that what you've studied in the way that it you that your brain sort of is used to apply, you know how you do your exams, how you revise. Um, so, for example, history, you're taking lots and lots of different facts, and you have to understand them to then be able to answer a question about history. And that's essentially what lawyers do. They take all the facts and they sort of work them out in their head think about it strategically, and then they'll be able to sort of plan ahead and maybe it's write a letter of advice, whatever it is. But what I'm saying is you don't necessarily have to do law. I would say that subjects that are quite similar to sort of that critical thinking and analysis would be your sort of English literature and history. 
but again i didn't study those i did what did i do i did three sciences and german and then started started spanish at university so i don't think there's any a levels that you should necessarily avoid or aim for as long as you can show in an application or explain in an interview how the way that you have to think and apply yourself to that subject you then could do in a law firm or working as a trainee i think i would say that's probably the best answer Great, thanks Sylvia. We've had another question which I think you might have touched upon a bit in, in that answer with saying that critical thinking and, and analysis is really important, but what qualities would you say are needed to work as a solicitor? What, what would a solicitor firm look for? That's a really good question. I would say that a really common misconception is that lawyers are either super boring or they're the loud, arrogant types that drive fast cars and stay up until 3 a.m. on big deals. Some of them are boring, thankfully not the ones I work with, but what I would say is that lawyers come from all different backgrounds and if there were sort of qualities that I see as being sort of consistent across the people that I work with, it's communication, that's a really, really big one because you might have to, say for example in the morning, you've got to be able to understand a really complicated area of law and then explain it to someone who really has no law background, say it's your client and they just want the answer, You've got to be able to explain that really carefully and clearly and take the steps when you're explaining it and have that sort of personal skills so you're looking them in the eye you know you're talking clearly you're not talking too fast as i might be right now um but communication is a really big one because you might be doing that in the morning but then in the afternoon you might have um you might be asked to make a speech in front of a judge in which case you've got to argue your point but you've got to do it professionally you know, and really politely. So it's kind of that communication, I would say is the main one. I'm trying to think of some more. Um, honesty is a big one because if I'm being honest, being dishonest gets you in a lot of trouble as a lawyer. We are held to an even higher standard than, you know, your average person in their average profession. And there's a lot of code of conduct and ethics. And um, so I would say honesty is a big one. If you can demonstrate that, um, then you'll go really far to impressing people in an interview or an application. Great. And a quick one here, do you, um, I think you've kind of answered this one, Sylvia, by saying that you can sort of do any subjects, but do you have to do a language or, or does a language help if you're kind of applying for That's a job? That's another or? really good question. Do you have to do a language? No, not at all. But I would say if you can, now I don't, you don't necessarily have to study at A level, but if you can show that you've been watching mm, films with for example French subtitles on Netflix and you can explain that you're you know doing some exercises alongside to show that you're trying to get your French better or whatever it is then if you're comparing two applicants like for like and they're exactly the same but one speaks a little bit better French it's just something else that you can add to your arsenal and your sort of you know your, your bag of weapons and trying to get a job um, or a place at university. I would say that languages come I'm biased because I did German and Spanish, but I think languages come in handy all the time in what I do. Um, occasionally I'll get asked to translate some things and that's the sort of more expected way that it's applicable, but in lots of other ways in that, you know, if you're translating something or you're interpreting something, you're having to listen to it, process it in your head, and then work out how the best way to, to sort of relay that information is. And we do that all the time as lawyers, because like I was saying earlier, and Charlotte's right, I kind of touched on it. If you've got to absorb some information and then sort of translate it in inverted commas to somebody else, then that if you're already quite good at that in your head, then that's brilliant. And, and we use the people that can speak who are bilingual or trilingual in my office. We have a little directory on our internet and if anybody ever has a problem they say is there anyone that can speak fluent polish and there will always be somebody and um, so i would say it really comes in handy but again if you don't speak a language already you know you don't have to but maybe try and watch a few things on netflix or you know improve it get a pen pal just whatever you can really great okay fantastic um, so i'm going to go back to some of the more general questions that we had um towards the beginning and bring charlotte back into this as well so um here's a, a really good question so after coronavirus, so after the lockdown and, and the pandemic has kind of ended, do you think your job will be impacted or it will change in any way? Charlotte, do you want to pick that one up to start off with? Sure, yeah. So that's a, that is a really, really good question. Um, and I would probably answer it by, by giving you an honest answer, which is I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I don't, don't think very many people know. And that's okay. Um, so, so it's likely that there will be lots of changes 
um, society wide. Um, and that's not just, you know, for me for, or for Lloyd's Banking Group, that's for the whole of society. Um, and I would say the primary reason for that is um, that we are, we are uh, going into and, and, and moving quite quickly into a global recession which will make things very, very difficult, not just for the UK, but for all countries around the whole world, where we'll have lots of businesses, lots of people that are really struggling financially, which is a really sad thing. Um, and what that means is that businesses will have to change and will have to adapt and will have to become more efficient, change the way they operate. Um, and, and that's just a fact of life, unfortunately. So. So um, it's likely that lots of banks will need to start helping people that are in what we call financial difficulty. So because they've lost their job or they can't afford to pay for their mortgage or they're struggling to, to even make ends meet and, and pay for food for themselves and their children. And that's something that, that banks are, are very, very aware um, is the, the responsibility that we have to do over the next 10 years or however long this recession will last so I think will my job be affected yes it probably will because um, I will be probably over the next few years making sure that I am helping personally um, people that are in financial difficulty as a result of the, 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 the um, recession that's been caused by coronavirus um, but I think there's nothing to worry about with that. Um, that. We have no control over it whatsoever. No one can see the future. No one has a kind of crystal ball. So I think um, as long as you continue to apply yourself, continue to um, do what you love, work hard, engage with your peers, um, there's nothing for you to worry about. Um, just making sure that you're engaging with your workplace. Um, and in the end, if something happens and, and people lose their jobs, then, then we just move on and try to find another job. So I think, um, yes, I suspect that there will be changes, but I don't want to give you guys the impression that there's something that I'm worried about or that you guys should be worried about, knowing that it's something that you're probably just starting to think about now. It might be a little bit more difficult, but um, it's, not, it's not like all of you are going to really, really struggle to get jobs. Um, so that's probably how I would answer that question. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Great, thank you, Charlotte. Um, Sylvia, do you want to add anything to that? Or I don't have much to add to that at all, Charlotte. That was a really, really comprehensive answer. And actually, I feel reassured as well. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would just say that, you know, with everything that's happening, you know, it's, it's opening up little avenues for enterprise. You know, you'll have seen different apps pop up and different ideas that have sort of come out of it. You know, that it won't be that everything shuts down. It'll be, I think there'll be a period of sort of quiet and then a sort of regeneration. Um, and there's a lot of room for, you know, big ideas. So, you know, just sort of hang in there. We're all hanging in there, um, but there will be, I think, time for ideas. And as lawyers, we're seeing a lot of new issues. I mean, we're seeing new areas of law, complete new areas of law, um, especially in the employment team. Um, we're getting queries about furloughing workers and, you know, um, how can we avoid redundancies and things like that? So, you know, that people are working really hard to, to try and mitigate the problems and make them less. But, yeah. Great. Fantastic. Um, and another kind of question for both of you. So um, someone's asked, what are some activities that I can do in my spare time to prepare me for the world of work? Oh, that's a good one. Charlotte, you want, I feel like we could tag team it, couldn't we? <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. So the list is infinite. You mm -hmm. could do... There are so many things that you can do at this stage that will help you later. And some of those things will be enjoyable things that you already like doing or that you are already doing. So just off the top of my head, um, I think the, the two biggest things that I did that I was really happy to do and that I think back and think those were really useful things that I was doing when I was 16 or 17, which are volunteering and team sports. So I did a lot of team sports. I played hockey for my school. I ran in a local athletics club. Um, and those things were really important for me in terms of learning how to be competitive and, and 
push for what I want, how to work in a team environment and engage with my peers in a way that's conducive to a successful outcome and how to you know, speak to people and have fun um, and also how to lose. It sounds, it sounds um, like a weird thing to say, but being resilient and being able to deal with failure is a thing that you, are, you deal with very quickly and very often in team sports. Um, and it's a really important thing for you to be able to learn when you're older because you might apply for a job but you might not get it or you might do a project and it might not go as well as you wanted and if you are already have those skills of resilience then um, you will find that it's enormously helpful for you and I think volunteering was the next biggest thing that, that really helped me so I worked in a charity shop and as I said I, I supported my local athletics club by coaching some of the kids that were younger than me and those, um, that volunteering was really important to me, for me to learn about empathy and compassion and helping other people. Um, and also a sort of a work, in, work environment. So you learn leadership skills by, by leading groups of people or supporting with an activity where you're the kind of primary lead. Um, and those are really important skills for, for a, an employer, you being able to show that you can work with other people, you can lead something, or you can be in a work environment, like in a charity shop, where it's, it's, a, it's a business, it's a charity, but it's a business, and you are supporting that business to run effectively. So um, I think those two things would probably be my piece of advice, but there's also so many other things, you know, try and speaking to your school about getting some work experience or reading, reading books, reading newspapers. If you can, if you think you can make it through a newspaper, I would really recommend doing that, learning about current affairs and what's going on in the world around you. It might feel a little bit boring now. And I, and I say that knowing because I did not want to read newspapers when I was 16, but um, I would recommend just giving it a go because it's so important being able to, to know what's happening in the world around you, especially at this kind of slightly uncertain time. So that would be, those would be my things. There we go, another 10 out of 10 answer from Charlotte, amazing. I would just say that sort of building on from Charlotte's point that my other big top tip that I say to work experience that comes you know, into our office, anyone I meet who's sort of your age, is that try and keep some sort of diary or a record of what you've been doing. So both in terms of your schoolwork, if you want to, you don't have to, um, but maybe more importantly, what you get up to in your spare time. So as Charlotte's saying, you know, all of these things build the skills that you can show employers why they should employ you and why you're a really great candidate. But, you know, it makes preparing for interviews or filling out job applications or personal statements a lot, a lot easier because everyone has so much going on and you guys must have a lot going on at the moment that it's really easy to forget little details, you know, about work experience that you really enjoyed how a particular event went at football practice, for example, you know, um, how you applied leadership skills there. It's kind of little details at that that make your interviews or your statements really stand out. And for one thing, you'll find it easy to talk about them with help from your memory jogging notes, but also because it'll be obvious to whoever you're trying to impress or convince of your commitment to whatever it is that you took a real interest in the subject and that you've got some of the qualities they're looking for and you can back it up. I, it's something I wish I'd done more, just even just a small note or a little diary so that when it comes to writing your personal statement, you don't sit in front of your computer with a blank A4 page and think, oh my goodness, why do I want to do languages? Well, you know, it's just little things like that. It makes, I think it makes life a lot easier in the long term. Um, and, it, and why not? Because you're showcasing, you know, how brilliant you are. Why not make a record of it? You can look back on it. Great. Thank you, Grace. Um, I'm just conscious of time, but we've got a couple more quick questions, I think. Charlotte, maybe you could take this thing that talks about the subjects that Sylvia done um, and, and what kind of gives you skills for a law career quite quite thoroughly, I think, in Sylvia's talk, which was great. So um, one student has asked, what subjects would you say help teach you skills for your job? So in terms of kind of banking, I guess, and project management. Mm. So... <laughs> I'm going to give a probably a very similar answer to Sylvia, which I suppose in some respects is really good for you. Um, so there is not a single subject at A level which will be better or worse for you to do if you want to work in banking because it's such a broad, broad place to work. As I said, there are so many different types of jobs that you can do when you work at a bank that it really does not matter at all what you do 
as long as you're showing that you're working hard and you're engaging in your subjects and you're you know you're passionate and you're hard working and excited to learn that is the single thing that is is the important thing for you to remember not the specific subjects um, I suppose going back to kind of the pieces of advice that I said um, there are lots of different types of things that you can do at the bank and some of them you'll really like and some of them you won't really like so I personally would not ever even try and attempt to work in what we call our finance team so that is the team that runs um, our numbers and looks at the profit of, of the group and of individual sections of the group and manages the money making sure that money is flowing around in the right places um, so so it, it's I suppose helpful for me to show the reason why we need a, a big finance team is that Lloyds Banking Group processes a third of the UK's payments every single day so that is billions of pounds going through every single day. And it's obviously extremely important for us to make sure that we are not losing any of that money, that we are, we know where every single penny is at every single second of the day. So it's important that someone has a really meticulous mathematical brain to work in our finance team teams and that is not me i i do not love maths i'm i'm okay at it but i will never profess to be a mathematical genius so i suppose it's just thinking about the types of things that you like and the subjects that complement them and the subjects that will complement the type of career that you want and you can take any subject and be you know move into banking so i did french maths chemistry and biology um, because I felt like it would give me a good kind of mix it would give me uh, writing and communication and languages but also because I sort of liked sciences and I was interested in biology so um, just thinking about what what interests you and 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 how that will help you in the future um, but I wouldn't worry too much about it really I really would not worry about too much about whether you need to do a specific subject to get into a career in the future, because the vast majority of, of banks anyway don't need any specific A-levels. They just need someone to be hardworking and committed and engaging and excited about learning. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlotte. That's great. OK, some speed questions for you then, Sylvia, very quickly from uh, some specific ones that have come back up again. Um, so. So this is a good question from someone. Um, despite the determination of working in a law firm, how hard is it sometimes to focus? Um, in terms of when I'm in the office, I'm going to assume, or yeah. Um, we're quite lucky in that we have quite a big office building. Our Knights' office is, um, it's above the Tesco's at the end of New Walk in Leicester City Centre. I don't know if anyone's familiar, but we're quite, we're quite lucky in that we've got sort of really nice open plan office. So. Um, the noise doesn't travel. It's not. It's not super loud. It's not difficult to concentrate. Um, I would say it's it, it's it's fine, really. Um, it's a bit different now, obviously, working from home because suddenly you know the distractions have, have gone down to zero, really, apart from my housemate because I still rent. Um, but I would say it's it can be difficult as a trainee because you're working for so many different people across different teams sometimes. Um, that you, you need to carve out sort of an hour of peace and quiet to really get your head around a difficult concept or some really tough legislation. For example, last week I got asked to do, we had to advise a client who, they're a big company and they send employees on projects to South Korea. But at the moment, South Korea has quite, well, very strict quarantine regulations. As soon as you arrive, you've got to quarantine for 14 days um, and download an app and fill in your symptoms every twice a day, I think, from memory. And our client needed that advice turned around really quickly, but it meant I had to get my head around two types of South Korean legislation and also their guidelines, which kept being updated. So I really, if I'd been in the office, might have taken myself off to a separate room just to get that peace and quiet. Um, but here, you know, it's a lot easier when you're working from home, um, obviously without distractions. Um, so it, it, it works quite well. And, and another good thing is that, you know, you're surrounded by, people at the same stage as you so I'm quite fortunate that because Knights is a big firm it's not sort of a smaller high street firm where I'm the only person at my level 
if I get asked to do something that's maybe partnership law when two people enter into business together, that's quite complicated. And it might be the first time that I've approached that. If there's somebody who's sitting, you know, three chairs away, four chairs away that I can just say, oh, I remember you did this two weeks ago. Can you, can we have a chat about it? That works really well. So there's a really good, I think lawyers are, as I was saying before, communication plays a big part, but we're really good at working together to ultimately take less time to do things and, and make things cheaper for our clients. Great, fantastic. And another quick one uh, for you, Sylvia. As a solicitor, do you need to speak in court? Do you need to speak in court? Very good question. So you, as a solicitor, not strictly, but you might, so for example, about, oh, it must have been December last year, we had an application where we were, oh, it's quite complicated, applying to have two, two companies that had been struck out, so had gone dissolved, gone bust, to have them reinstated because they owed our client a debt. Long story short, yes, I had to go because I get sent, because I'm the trainee, to go up to Leicester County Court and stand in front of a judge and call him sir. And he said, you know, has the court fee been paid on these two? And I just had to say, yes, sir, to the best of my knowledge, it has been paid. I, I don't have any confirmation with me because, of course, the person I was working for didn't send me with any. Um, so occasionally you'll get asked to speak in court, but it's very, very rarely at my level. And by the time you do get asked to, it, you know, you, you've seen it done a million times before. I would say, though, it's never like it is on TV. It's a lot more nerve wracking. Um, but you can. So as I was saying before, you can be a solicitor where you don't typically speak in court and you work in an office or you can be a barrister. They're self-employed and their sole job is standing up in court and making the arguments or writing the documents that, you know, set the arguments out. There's a sort of middle ground where you can be what's called a solicitor advocate from memory um, where you just do a little extra course. And it means that if you've got a matter that isn't worth very much in terms of the fees that you're going to be getting and the client really doesn't want to pay a barrister's fees which can be I mean they can get extortionate they can be up to a thousand pounds an hour if the client really can't afford that you can do this course and then be able to say look at my reduced rate I can stand up and present to the judge but obviously I won't be I won't have a wig on and it won't be quite as sort of um important sounding but yeah so you can you can speak in front of a judge in, in court as a solicitor. It, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be a criminal court, that's for sure. That's always barristers. But occasionally we get asked to, yeah. Great, fantastic. Um, I think we can say, uh, so someone's asked, if you were to do something law-related within a school, do you have more of an advantage of getting that job if you can do it on your CV? And we would say yes, definitely. If you do something directly related to the kind of career that you want to do, then definitely put that one on your CV. Yeah. Um, and this is a good question for both of you. Um, when you were in secondary school, did you have a different job in mind um, to the one that you're doing now? I love this question because the answer is yes. I had a different, I had a different idea of what I wanted to do probably every month. And it was only until I wrote my personal statement and had to make a decision. But as you guys will know, my decision was to study my favourite A-level and start a new one from scratch. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily a snapshot of where you end up. But I changed my mind. I wanted to be a vet. That's why I did three sciences. Then that went out the window. So, yes, it changes. And I would say, you know, on average, I think in the UK, people change their careers about 10 or 12 times. You know, different jobs. You might stay within your sort of career path. But, you know, people dip in and out of law all the time. And it's not seen as anything negative. In fact, gaining experience elsewhere is, is looked upon favorably, really. I don't know if Charlotte, Charlotte's probably similar I feel like everyone exactly is exactly the same exactly yeah. the same so I um I changed my mind so many times and I also had periods of time where I hadn't even made up my mind where I had absolutely no idea and it was something that really worried me um that I didn't know I mean I, I think when I was in primary school I wanted to be an English teacher and I think that was mostly because I just really loved my English teacher and I thought she was really good at her job um and then I wanted to be a doctor for a while. Um, I, I thought about being a vet. I then, I really liked biology. Um, I, th I thought about do, being a pathologist because I saw a TV show that I really liked, Silent Witness. Probably you guys don't remember that, but I really, I went through so many different ideas and that was a good thing for me, changing my mind and you know, learning about things, looking into different 
careers that I could do is actually, you know, one of the best things that you can do. Um, if you've made up your mind about what you want to do when you're older, great. But don't be too fixed on that because you might find that you, you know, you actually don't like it or you find it really difficult to get a job there or, or it's not the right time for you or it doesn't turn out to be what you think it is. Um, and also, if you don't know what you want to do, great as well because just because you don't want know what you want to do now does not mean that you can't try a few things and find out what you like what you don't like sometimes actually i found from jobs i have learned more from the things that i haven't liked about that job than i have learned about the things that i liked about it so i worked in an office that was in weirdly i didn't even think about it until i started it but i worked in a windowless office in my first job that i ever did and I will never do that again. If I find out that I'm working in a windowless office, I will not do it because I just found that the whole days were going by where I didn't see the sunshine and that really upset me. So honestly, you can try loads of different things and you don't really know what you do and don't like until you just give it a go. Wonderful, thank you both. Okay, one final question for you, Sylvia. I'm gonna combine two in this box. So, well, have you got any tips to, for students to improve their legal knowledge or debating skills? Oh, that's a really good question. So in terms of debating skills, well, I would say if, you're, if your school doesn't have a debating club, then set one up because that will look really good on an application and it plugs a gap if there isn't one already. And I appreciate that could be quite difficult and maybe it's your last year of school. Um, but I suppose on the flip side, if you go to university, or you can probably find local debating clubs um, anywhere really. But that's a really good question because by debating you get to practice sort of that advocacy um, and the sort of arguing, as I said, professionally and politely when you may not want to be professional or polite um, is, is a really good way of, of practicing as a, as a lawyer. So well done whoever put that question in for recognizing that that's a really good skill to have. Um, I would say the other part was, what was the second part of that question? Advocacy and debating. And legal knowledge. Legal knowledge. Um, I mean, there's, I would say that you can keep up to date with sort of legal things that are happening quite easily. If you, maybe the Guardian website, there's a law section on there, sort of the news, there's often things get thrown up in the news. Um, and I would say that's probably the best place to start because articles that are published on the news and or LinkedIn is another great place. Um, tend to be already almost pre-digested. So I do it all the time because I don't want to read a whole case summary because it can be 100 pages long and it's written the way judges speak and it's not user friendly. But if someone else has read it and summarized it and maybe given a few opinions about it, then that's a really good place to start. And those kind of articles you can find on a lot of sort of sort of higher end news websites or um, and just keeping your eyes peeled, really, even just a Google search would be would be a good place to start. And again, you can talk about that in an interview. And, and if you spot a real gap, then there's nothing stopping you starting to blog about, you know, legal points that you come across or, you know, a piece of legislation that comes out. Yeah, I would just say if, if, if you're looking for something and you can't easily find it, usually that's a really good sign that there's maybe a gap in the market. But even on a more sort of basic level, there's just a bit of a gap there. And, and with technology today, you can easily plug that, I think. Great, thank you, Sylvia. Okay, final question then, Charlotte, I'm gonna throw this one over to you. Um, so you both talked about um, communication skills being really key in your jobs, um, but do you sometimes find it hard to communicate with people and what tips would you give for people who find that a bit more difficult potentially? Sure, yeah. So the answer to that question is definitely yes. Um, do I find it hard to communicate with people sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. Um, even someone who, I mean, I sell myself as someone that's good at communicating. That's my kind of thing that I tell everyone as to why they should hire me for a job. Um, so even with that in mind, I find it difficult to communicate with some people in, in you know, in a work setting and outside a work setting as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I suppose the first most basic thing to say, which I'm sure you'll all recognise, but just to, to make sure you understand that a working setting it's kind of similar to your kind of your school setting or your home setting whereby there will be some people that you get on with really really well some people that you don't get on quite with you know don't get on with quite so well and some people that secretly you really just do not like at all um, there are that, that is the same in the working environment because the people that you 
you know, really loved or didn't like quite so much at school grow up and then move into the world of work in exactly the same way. So, you know, but I suppose this, the difference in the world of work is that you have no choice but to try to communicate with these people, even if it is a little bit difficult or it's something that you find that you're not quite, um, you know, you don't find it quite as easy as you think maybe some people, uh, some other people do. And I suppose the thing, so the way that I, I do with it is, is just um, kind of trying to find things in common between myself and that person, even when at first it's kind of, sight it feels a little bit difficult um, and also I suppose just trying to make sure I think carefully about the way that I'm communicating with other people thinking about their feelings how they think they might perceive what I'm saying to them or about a specific situation making sure that I'm communicating simply I'm listening to them when I'm being clear there's something in the world of work and uh, and maybe Syl Sylvia will back me up on this one but uh, and especially in banking there are absolutely loads of acronyms flying around everywhere for the PAC and the DA double B and all sorts of all sorts of acronyms that make it really really difficult to engage with people um, and I try as much as I possibly can to not use those because I just I find that they don't help me engage with other people and I think on the most basic level if communicating is something that you find really really difficult and you really find it stressful um, and it's something that makes you feel anxious and nervous then there's, like, there's lots of things that you can learn and you can do to try to calm yourself down and, 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 um, and um, kind of make it better for yourself by practicing now as much as you can. But also thinking about kind of going back to the thing that I said earlier about how, if it's something you don't like doing, you really just do not like engaging with people and communicating with people. It's something that you find causes you loads of anxiety then think about that as something that you need to think about for your future career. You know, can you do a career that involves you kind of concentrating on one thing on your own and, and working diligently on, on one project. You know, there's lots of jobs that do that, like translators and people that, that write books and, and authors or people that, that do copywriting. So they, they check books or writing newspapers. You know, there's all sorts of stuff, all sorts of jobs that don't involve loads and loads of communication with other people. And there are all sorts of jobs that do. So try to think about that now and, and think about how you're going to play to your strengths. But don't, I think, um, just because it's something that you don't like doesn't mean that you shouldn't try and practice it now because ultimately communicating with other human beings is a kind of basic thing in life that you need to practice as much as you can. So I would encourage you, if you find it difficult, to try to get out your comfort zone occasionally and go and speak to some kids in school that you don't know or you know, introduce yourself to new people, have conversations with your teachers about it, about how you can improve it, um, because it is something that is an important thing in the workplace. Wonderful, thank you. And that's the end of all of our questions. So thank you very much to everyone who's joined us today. Some really good, really interesting questions. Uh, from you all and thank you so much to our two speakers Charlotte and Sylvia really insightful inputs some really great advice and answers to those questions so thank you very much for taking the time out of your day um, to join us this morning it was really really good um, we are going to send the recording of this around to all of our partner schools so anyone who's um, joined us you can see the recording afterwards um, but until then thank you very much to everyone um, have a nice rest of this lovely, lovely day um, and we'll have our next webinar in two weeks time. Thanks everyone. Thank you.